Tell me about your family life and your upbringing. I've, I think we've had an interview before you mentioned about growing up in quite a religious Christian family. Yeah, right? yeah. I went to church every Sunday for the most part, but it was never like uh, it was never like a forced thing, mm-hmm. you know. It was. I mean, I had to go to church, but it was never like a, you know, religion was never like like forced you know what I mean it was just kind of like this is what you know we were a Christian family we believe in God this that and then you know as I got I was relatively young when I just kind of got you know saw it for what I think you know it is which is just kind of you know uh, I, I what I saw out of it was you know because I went to Christian high school and in order in order to in in Christian schools at that time at least in my school there was a lot of hate like just towards other people okay you know what I mean from the teachers or the people yeah just in general I mean that's one of the things I I hate about religion is that you know it's supposed to be this um, you know just amazingly you know beautiful way to be in touch with you know the creator of the earth and the heavens and all that stuff but you know the the ugly reality of it is it's just basically a lot of people saying you know my god's better than your god and stuff like that so the the humanity of it the finger pointing the you know we're going to heaven but you know their groups going to hell that whole thing i just never really got into that you know and so i i kind of learned at a young age that it was kind of an individual choice for me and, you know, my mom and dad didn't really trip on it. I just stopped going to church, you know. I mean, my dad mostly went to church because he was in AA and, like, with the 12 steps and all that stuff, it's kind of a, a pretty major part of it. He's God, right? You know, yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So it's like that was more or less kind of his reasoning. Um, and, you know, he was, a, a, you know, a, a big-time Christian dude. Uh, my mom is more like me, you know what I mean? So she was just pretty much going to church because they had like aerobic classes and you know. and to support <laughs> yeah her husband yeah, yeah. And to support her husband so yeah that that was pretty much it. My brother got really into it. I, I know I'm the youngest one, so my brother's see I'm 37. My brother's 41. My sister I she'll kill me if I tell if I say it. So I won't <laughs> she's say older it. than you. She's older than me. <laughs> so by that you know by the time my brother was super into church, um, more so than my sister and me. But, you know, everyone was kind of over it by the by the time, um, you know, I was, you know, in junior high age, I guess you could say, like, you know, young teens. Uh, it just kind of started, you, you could start to see kind of like, you know, chinks in the armor, so to speak, you know what I mean? So we just kind of branched off and did our own thing. My dad kept going. That was pretty much it. What are you like as a kid? You know, you strike me someone now at this stage of life, having only known you a couple of years, who's always been very sociable and... yeah. Were you a popular kid? Did you yeah, have a lot yeah, of friends? Yeah, I, I, you know, I've always been uh, uh, comfortable in any environment, really. You know, in school, I was, you know, friends with, uh, you know, the the nerds, the, the weirdos, the you know, the musicians, the uh, uh, athletes. You know, it, you know, just kind of. I, I can always find the positive in anything. You know, and I, I like being a well-rounded person. So, I was never really you know the type of person that was you know hunkered in the back or, or or you know not willing to talk to anyone i've always been pretty outgoing i used to do these <laughs> these fucking speech meet things as a kid where you like get up and like read poems in front of people and you act them out and all this stuff and uh, yeah that's probably the one thing i could probably trace back to like being connected to what i actually turned out doing for a living you know but other than that i've always just been kind of a i, I just love hanging out you know were you a good student? Did you get good grades? Did you work no, hard? No, no. I've, no. I, you know, I, I was never like, uh, I, yeah, I was always, I've always been like a, you know, average student. You know, BC maybe. I always loved history, so I got A's in history. Terrible at math, um, but you know, as a lot, as with a lot of kids, like you know, as you kind of get older and you like go through like, you know like high school days when you're discovering like all the joys of being just like a you know teenage just you know asshole you mm-hmm. know like my chasing grades, girls getting yeah, drunk yeah, yeah. yeah. my grades slipped and you know going back to the religion thing I was so you know, upset about <clears throat> you know that whole system that I was in that you know it made me you know care way less you know and I you know I wish like you know, I, I, it's not that I don't have an education. I have, I feel pretty solid in my education. I, I wish I could have, 
gone to college for a little bit just to kind of see what it was like. But at the time, I mean, I just didn't, I didn't, yeah, I didn't, I had no, like, no desire to go at all. Like, I was just like, fuck this, you know, I'm out, you know, I'm just going to get a job and fucking try to fucking make some money and, you know, see what my friends are doing and hang out. I, did, I had no idea what I was going to do. I wanted to play music, you know, but it's like, I didn't really think that it was ever going to be like a serious thing at that point, you know? So, so you, you weren't what you'd perhaps call an ambitious young person in the <clears> sense <throat> that you didn't see yourself as going, right, I'm going to form a band, no, I'm going to take no. on the world kind you of. You know, it was, it was really funny. I had this, <laughs> this moment uh, in, in Boston, like three weeks ago, we were, we were in, in Boston, like right where Harvard it was, we had a couple of weird gigs on this last tour in the U.S. We played Princeton, this like uh, Latin Heritage like student academy thing that was really cool. But we played in Boston, and we were right next to Harvard. And uh, I was sitting like by myself in like Chipotle, you know what I mean? And I was just like, <laughs> like some angry student made me this like terrible burrito, you know? And so I'm sitting there. I'm like filthy, you know, and I'm just like, I'm hanging out, just staring out the window, just watching all these different versions of life walk past. And, uh, you know, I hear these two girls, these two young girls, probably, you know, first year of college, I was assuming just by the way they were talking. And, you know, this girl was just like venting to her friend at what a shitty uh, guidance counselor she had. And she was like, I, you know, I was like, you know, this is, I remember her saying to a friend, you know, I told my counselor, like, you know, this isn't just some decision, you know, this is my future, this is my career. And I just remember, like, man, like, I just, it kind of shook me because I was like, God, that was like, I was so not that person, you know what I mean? And I have friends who are, who are like that, who have always been kind of career oriented and they're, you know, most time those people grow up to be very successful. But at that time, you know, like it, it's always a trip for me to see people who are, and it's not, it's not a bad thing at all, but just who are complete opposites of kind of where I was at that age, you know what I mean? Or where you are in life now. It's just always interesting to see uh, different mindsets and stuff like that. And so I, I remember sitting there and was like laughing at myself because I was like, God, man, look at me. You know, I'm just sitting here scumbag of the year. And this, you know, this girl's <laughs> like actually worried and concerned about her future, like at school. You know, when I was in school, I didn't give, you know, that's the last thing I cared about, you know? <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, it was it was pretty funny, man. But, yeah, I, I you know, I, I, I try to like, you know, it's awesome nowadays because you can pretty much learn anything you want on the Internet. You know, if you want, if, if I wanted to go and, you know, jump back into fucking any sort of education, I'm sure I could. But I'm pretty busy nowadays. So Yeah, you are incredibly busy. I mean, well, let's go to, I guess, the formation of the Bronx. Um, how old were you? How did you meet the original guys? And, you know, how did... Is it four of you to begin with? The four yeah, piece? Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. It was a four piece, and so it, the original members are myself, uh, Jorma, Vic, Joby Ford, and James Tweedy. And uh, you know, I was kind of the outsider, or I, I, or I was. You know, Joby worked at Vagrant Records at the time with James, who played bass in the band, uh, and Jorma was kind of in a. Uh, he, you know, there's like tears in music, you know, so it's like, or in anything, you know, obviously. So, you know, there's like basically like high school bands, which is like, you know, going nowhere bands, which is like kind of what I was doing with my friends. Jorma was on that like next level where he, he was in a band that like was like signed to like a, a small, like little punk independent label, but they would like, they could play shows and like have an actual crowd, you know what I mean? Like they, they toured, they were like, you know, doing decent. So he knew Joby through that because since Joby worked at a label and all that stuff. So those guys all knew each other, and Joby met me through my brother. Um, and so Joby and I just kind of, you know, we it was just kind of, you know how you have, like, different friendship groups, you know what I mean? So I was kind of like, I was one of Joby's buddies, you know? So it ended up that they, uh, you know, they started putting this... Uh, they started putting this uh, band together, to, you know, to do something different, and uh, they needed a singer. So uh, Joby um, brought me up to the dudes, and I came in, and you know, I auditioned. I guess you could say. How was that? Was that nerve wracking? 
Uh, I wouldn't say nerve wracking. It's just awkward, you know, because it's not like you're auditioning for the Who or yeah, something. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like it's not like that. You know what I mean? It's just a fucking a couple of ding dongs, you know? Like I, it wasn't really any, yeah, yeah. Uh, any pressure, you know. So, but it was just a little weird, you know. It's because it, at that time, Joby and I were were playing in a band called the Drips that is still going today. But at the time, we were kind of playing pretty frequently. It was like a bar band, you know. Uh, and uh, and so that's kind of why you know Joby wanted me involved and and I'm super stoked you know because it, it was it was it, you know those kind of there's there's certain moments in your life that have like uh, you know that steer there are big moments you know they're pivotal moments where they steer you in a in a direction you know they're not just like kind of everyday events it's like this kind of you know sets you on a path and uh, and that was definitely one of them you know uh, you know it's like being able to actually get outside of like my group of friends that I grew up with just messing around playing music into an actual even though it was just a rehearsal and like a different kind of more professional environment to see and attempt and play and you know hear music in a different way you know changed everything you know for me so it was like you know being able to have that opportunity was was awesome you know and it was uh you know we it, it was always it was pretty you know Jorma and I had a kind of a rough <laughs> rough start at first because you know I, I I thought his band was kind of like you know like a, a little you know I just didn't think they were punk enough you know what I mean so I didn't think he was punk enough and you know I think he didn't think that I was you know probably skilled enough or you know all that stuff so we kind of had a little back and forth for I, I'm probably only lasted a couple months I mean we we squashed that pretty quickly but yeah that was pretty much it and James was you know James was pretty a, a pretty quiet dude you know he just kind of was just you know stoked to play bass so uh, it, it was fun man you know the the early days of the Bronx was a lot of fun because it was like everything happened so quick you know it was like going from you know doing nothing you know with like your high school buddies and all of a sudden we're in this band we have three songs we're actually recorded which is something that you know i kind of done but not really you know so it's like you know we recorded three songs and then like you know because of those guys and their actual musical you know knowledge of the industry and all that stuff you know it's like we had like a manager we had this we had that next thing you know it's got like labels looking at us and like all this crazy stuff and it was like honestly it felt like within you know two months of that uh, first rehearsal it was like crazy it was like we had like a record deal you know it just like everything was so fast you know it was crazy what was the first song you wrote as the bronx uh i think it was it was either white tar or uh or strobe life the first three songs were heart attack uh, White Tar and uh, and Strobe Life. So, um, you know, it was one of those. I'm pretty sure because I know the intro to Heart Attack kind of came together like as we were writing it. I think it was White Tar was the first song. And where were you at as a person in your life in your headspace then? What informed the lyrics? And oh, what you were I was a mess. To write about? I was oh, I was so bad. I was uh, high on speed. I was a really bad drug addict at that time. Um, How did you I'm, fall into that? Uh just insecurity and like no direction and you know just like I don't know you know I was just kind of in school I, I you know I, I just kind of I've always you know had taken a liking to you know exploring and and you know and when you're young drugs are a part of that and you know I, I got a little too carried away um, and I you know I really I'm, I'm glad it wasn't like heroin or anything but speed's pretty bad you know so I was I was pretty tweaked on that stuff for a good for a good amount of time and uh, in the early days of the Bronx I was you know did you have to get fully sober before you could then allow yourself to drink and actually you know enjoy vices in a normal way again does that make no, sense no no I never really did like the you know like I mean I I definitely stopped doing speed <laughs> but like I didn't I never really had to do I mean, you didn't have to it, go to rehab or anything like no, that no no I mean I overdosed and that was like it wasn't like a you know I didn't like die and come back it wasn't any sort of Nikki Six situation but it was enough for me to be like okay you know like and now I'm very thankful for 
uh, you know, my mom, my dad, they gave me kind of the ability to be able to look at yourself from outside yourself and have, you know, I have common sense and I have a smart enough uh, brain and strong enough willpower to be able to understand when I'm at, like, I can't control something and be like, okay, it's time to change this, you know? Like, I, I've been able, I've been fortunate enough to be able to do that in my life, which is amazing because a lot of people can't, you know, when something gets a hold of them, it gets a hold of them. So, you know, I, I'm thankful that I didn't get too bad, you know, but yeah, it was, it was pretty tough and it was for a long time, you know, it was like the first... I don't know, probably all the way, I think the worst it was was during the bat CP, the Bronx bat CP. I was out of my mind and I just had, I had no lyrics and I was literally like doing speed in like gas station bathrooms and like writing, you know, trying to come up with lyrics in my car and like, it was, it was. Just pretty, running around town like a wild man. Yeah, 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 absolutely. Like, you know, on just on one and, uh, and you know, but it's like, I, I, it is what it is. I look back about it and I talk about it because I'm, I'm not ashamed of it. You know, it's like it's all part of my life and it's all part of the path that brought me here today. And it's like, you know, it's it's all good. You know, it's like people go through fucking crazy shit in their lives, you know. So could have been worse, could have been better. But, you know, it's 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 my kind of gig. So, you know, I just I'm, I'm stoked that I'm in a better place now. And, you know, I'm still go down my wormholes every now and then, as we all do. But, hey, man. you know, it's like. <laughs> I, you know, I, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty stoked at, you know, how I kind of came out of all of it and the fact that, you know, the Bronx is still going and, you know, it's like James is in Canada, you know, Jorma moved on to Eagles of Death Metal, which is awesome. And, you know, what's the deal? <clears throat> excuse me. What's the deal there? Is that a, a mutual party? Yeah, or? yeah, yeah. That was just like, it was, you know, it, there was uh, some... Uh, there was some tough dynamics in the band just as the band gets older and you know different people want different things out of it you know so it gets uh, it gets tough sometimes to make everyone happy and as you grow as an individual your own needs become different than everybody else's you know like when you start a band it's usually like all for one one for all like you know us against the world type thing and it, that never changes but it just gets more complicated as you evolve you know as you you know, if you get like a record deal, if you have a crowd, if you're like, you know, as the band gets more attention and gets bigger and life goes on and, you know, you're still doing this thing, you know, 10, 12, 13 years later, um, it's just, it's not the same as it was when it started. So, you know, it's like, it, it sucks to have to, to split apart from people that you've, you know, gone through so much with. You know, but it like it's just you know sometimes it's just the the best thing to do for the situation, and it's like you know the band was kind of at a standstill for a really long time, and there was just some things that needed to be addressed, and so you know it's like it's it's it it worked out for the best because everyone involved has something going on, and you know has something that you know they can put their energy into you no know. one's been left behind exactly yeah exactly so you know for, <laughs> he's for got us, to contend with jesse now though man <laughs> yeah yeah you yeah, know, that's a wall man yeah absolutely <laughs> absolutely man you know but he's killing it and and it's great you know it's uh, we're, we're all super stoked for him and and we're you know super stoked to be able to move forward and and start on bronx five so um, you know, I, I think it's it's always a shitty situation when you have to go through that, you know, especially personally, you know, because it's, that's pretty much what it's all about. You know, it's not really a like a band thing. It's like a personal thing, you know, because you've been through so much with each other. It's like it sucks. That's where you feel it the most. You know, it's like you don't necessarily miss someone as a drummer or a guitar player, as a singer. It's like you miss them as a friend, you know, so uh, that's the part that sucks, you know, but it's like you know we're we're all you know pretty uh, mature human beings so i think everything's all right you know but you know it's uh it's you know it is what it is so onward and upward i think every band should be a gang and have that gang mentality you yeah. you guys in particular haven't spent a lot of time around you you seem to be a very tightly bound close unit of individuals yeah yeah absolutely man i mean that's just the way we roll you know i mean we we always you know look out for each other we work hard for each other you know and it's like we hold each other accountable and you kind of just have to you know the great thing about 
this band and you know the thing I think that you could probably you'd want out of any situation you know whether it's like a working relationship or a, a, a an actual significant other type relationship but you just want to be able to be yourself you don't ever want to feel like you have to you know hide any sort of your personality for you know for better for worse and and with us everything's out on the table you know with each other and and with what's going on and and with what we got to do and what we want to accomplish and you know whether it's on a day-to-day thing or like you know over time thing it's like we, we all work hard for each other and we've you know we've been through some of the raddest stuff ever you know so we're very fortunate and hey, we love we still love what we're doing it's been very nice for me every night to be stood on the side of the stage and watch you go through the instrumental mariachi song and give everyone their moment in the spotlight to shine you know not yeah. just on the instrument that they play but their character and what they bring to the yeah. whole yeah, it's, a, it's a cool thing to do. You know, it's like it. That, you know, the mariachi thing is it has it has so much. Uh, you know, so many unique opportunities. Um, you know, have come from that band and just it, just musically speaking on the stage every night. It's just uh, it's a lot of fun, man. You know, it, it's just a really cool thing. And to, I trip out at you know uh, all the talent. You know that that I get to be surrounded by on a nightly basis. You know because I mean. I know I can sing and all that stuff, but it's like, you know, it's like these guys, you know, everyone in the band is just ripping, you mm-hmm. know, and it's, yeah. it's just awesome. It's it's super cool. So, you know, th- those guys, you know, the Joby, Vince, Dave, Rebecca, you know, Brad, Keith, Ken, it's like they can play, you know, pretty much anything you put in front of them. So it's, it's awesome to see. Let's talk about punk rock. Obviously, that's your heart, your root, yes, your world. My roots. What's it given you, um, <laughs> and what do you think the unique quality of that? Not even seen because it's bigger than that. That ideology, perhaps, yeah. that school of thought, yeah. has has given the world as well at large. Yeah, I mean, for me, it's uh, you know, it gave me self worth, you know, which was like a big deal because that's what I was kind of struggling with, you know. That's why I was kind of you know i'm like a, 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 a an old soul type of person so it's like not having a purpose is like something that you know sends me to the you know to the graveyard so it's like you know having getting that self-worth and getting that kind of purpose out of music was like the greatest thing ever for me you know because i you know i i wouldn't i wasn't going to find it on my own you know it was just something that kind of had to happen and and you know listening to punk music growing up was the thing that kind of led me to it so you know i've always subscribed to that kind of just kind of be your own person work hard and do what you want to do and don't take any shit from people and you know go for it so that's that's what it is to me and i mean i know i love you know the music too you know it's like it's just my style you know short aggressive just blasts of energy you know negative and positive you know I, i i appreciate it all I saw you at the Brooklyn Bowl show when you did Bronx on your day off, yeah, yeah, just yeah. behind the curtains watching uh, GBH, just with you know a shit-eating grin from ear to ear on your face, oh, just yeah. like as if this is my life. Oh no! So you still yeah, obviously get that buzz. Oh yeah, and being around like, people that was, like that. That was one of the coolest things ever, you know, because you get, uh, you know, I mean, you you. you uh, anything can become a grind you know and that doesn't necessarily mean it's a bad thing it just means you know you get caught up in it because you're doing it every day and it's like there's certain moments that shine because of that you know there's certain things that just become day-to-day kind of monotony because of that too but having you know the gbh guys who have been you know always super super cool to us you know one of our the early early first bronx tours we did was bronx and uh gbh and circle jerks across the u.s and when you do that you don't really you know you don't really expect to like become friends with all these people you know you're just kind of like wow this is amazing you know i hope i don't fucking piss them off and those guys you know and us and circle jerks too all became just so tight and to think that you know I can call those guys friends and we can call those guys friends. It's amazing. And when you watch them play, they're still so fucking good. I mean, it's like Colin's voice is amazing. You know, it's like you, you see Jacques and she's Scotty and, you know, Ross wasn't there, but it's like those guys are just awesome, you know, and, and, and I love them and have, being able to have them uh, play with us at the ball was, was pretty, pretty amazing. Tell me about the second Bronx record. Uh, obviously that one, you sort of expanded what you were doing a bit and, 
I think you guys have always been progressive, and sometimes you risk backlash and criticism as a yeah. punk, as a punk band for yeah. wanting to change and yeah. move forward. Um, what was the um, well? How was the recording of it? First of all, what comes to <laughs> mind, and then what was the response at the time? Do you remember from? Uh, you know, the recording of it was insane. Uh, you, you know, it was like it was a, a dream come true, and it was like it, it was complete. So, you know, it was one of these things that, like, turned into, uh, you know, it turned into a nightmare. And then it's like, looking back on it, it was, you know, one of the greatest experiences of my life. But it's like, you still don't really, like, Joby and I still aren't really sure if, oh, I think we are sure. If we were going to go back and record it, we wouldn't do it the same way. Right. But I think the fact that it did happen that way, you know shaped us you know in, in a lot of ways you know and gave us so many great kind of uh different you know views on music you know and how to approach it from a creative standpoint so it's like we get you know bronx 2 is the, the major label record you know it's michael beinhorn producing you know he's done everything you know sound garden and red hot chili peppers and social distortion corn and all these crazy million dollar you know millions sold records you know and we have this old screening studio in venice beach this giant building on the boardwalk you know we've got it for as long as we need it you know and it's like i'm taking like vocal lessons i'm like i mean this is going from like you know outhouse to the penthouse like in one record you know what i mean just like boom and that was kind of thing we weren't really sure about like but at the end of the day the decision was, hey, we know that this is an opportunity that we have. This is something that if we don't do this, we're going to kick ourselves in the ass. We're not going for it. Of you know? course. Like, you have to. Yeah. You have to do that. So so we did. And, you know, it was like, I mean, it was one of those things, dude. It was like, you know, it was like classic. You get in, you're super excited, you know, you think you're going to end up, like, recording the record in one day, you don't do anything the first day, you know, you're, like, building these drum platforms for, like, two weeks, and then, <clears throat> you know, you spend, like, another two weeks on a kick drum sound, and next thing you know, you're, like, a month and a half in, and, you know, you don't even have, like, drums tracked yet, you know, and so it takes on this crazy, like, Brian Wilson, Dewey Cox type you know <laughs> mythology you know and you're just like this punk band and then you know but it's like the learning process was so amazing you know because uh you know for me personally i imagine you had a lot of downtime right where you were just a ton, there a ton of downtime you know were you in the studio observing it all were you observing yeah i was living there man you know i i, I stayed there so you know i was living and and, and, and that was you know, the, the cool thing about it was, you know, we fucking played those songs live in that fucking room over and over and over and over and over and over and over again until we fucking got it right. And it's like, <clears throat> that's what ruled about that record, you know? It was like, like, it was us, you know? That, that's, that was us just fucking hammering that shit out. And, you know, it, it was a long fucking process. And doing... You know, doing the vocals at the end when all the music was done, it was a nightmare for me. I mean, it was like, you know, it went, I never forget, it was like, you know, we, we did, you know, we, I don't, pro we probably spent, I don't know, three, four months on the music. Okay. And then it's like, and Beinhorn's notoriously hard on singers, you know, so it was like singers and drummers were like the people he like, you know, he's always firing drummers, always, you know, causing singers to just have nervous breakdowns. So, we start, I think we got the vocals late uh, in the evening, and, you know, we did the literally the first song, Small Stone, and <clears throat> we got through it, we did like two, three takes of it, and he was like, boom, we got it, you know, that's it, we're like, that's good, let's move on, and it was like, that was the end of the night, so that was cool, we came back tomorrow, and he was like, you know, I listened to it, and we don't got it. And I was like, okay, you know, cool, cool. It's all good, you know, and then proceeded to spend, you know, the next, I don't know, you know, four months, you know, tracking vocals to when it got so bad to where we couldn't even be in the same room together. 
uh, you know, Joe being the engineer, this guy Nick, he they had to do the recording just because, you know, it, Michael does this whole Marine Corps thing, you know, where he, it's like the break you down and build you back up thing. And it was, whether it's completely necessary, I don't really think is the point. It's just, it's just what he does, you know, and it's like, so... I was going through that whole process of his and I, you know, I was so young, I fell right into it. Like he smashed me, you know what I mean? Yeah. Like I, I was like this big, you know, and, 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 you know, I was able to come back from it and I learned a lot of awesome stuff about myself and about my voice and about what I can achieve and how far I can push myself and what I can do because of that and because of him. But it was, uh, you know, it was it, it took all the fun out of making the record. You know, it's like when I look, when I listen back, when I listen back to it, I'm proud of what we achieved and how what like it took us to get there. But I don't listen back to it, and I listen back and I'm like, wow, my voice sounds amazing, and all these instruments sound amazing. But I don't look back like making the record wasn't fun. Is that trade off worth it for the result? Yeah, I, yeah, I think so because you know I don't I don't need my entire life to be fun. You know what I mean? Like the trials and and going through tough times is what you know kind of shapes you as a human being. So it's like it doesn't always need to be a roller coaster ride, you know, and cotton candy and all that shit. So yeah, it was worth it. You know, it was definitely worth it. But it just uh, you know it was it was crazy, and that was definitely the last time you know we'll ever do something like that you know i think we we it's not an experience you would look to yeah well it's just not really something that we i I don't really i don't really think it 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 works best for us you know what i mean i i think we're we're better when we're when we don't overthink things when we're just in the zone and when we're playing and when we're happy and we're grooving and you know i don't think you know what i'll let me go back because i will i will say this i think that we're the type of band that only needed to be broken down once. Right. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, completely. And he was the guy to do it. And yeah. so there's no need to do that again. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, we've been broken down, and now we're completely aware of who we are and what we can do. So There'd going be nothing forward, new to learn. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So going forward, there's no need to repeat that process. You know, so I'm thankful, you know, to him for taking that on, you know. But it's like, you know, and I'm, I'm glad we kind of learned that lesson, you know. So... Every record after that, we did pretty in-house, you know. Three, we did at our own studio. Uh, Same with four. And, uh, you know, it's like we don't have our studio anymore, so we'll probably do five, you know, with, you know, some, you know, kind of just low-key producer or something like that. You know, we'll see. We we still got to write the songs, you know. We got to figure out where the songs are at before we do anything else. So, you know, that's that. But, yeah, the, the second record was... It was a trip, man. It was a, you know, it was, uh, it was growing up real fast, you know. And the mariachi, um, where did the idea come from? How did the kind of the gestation of it come about, and what's it brought you guys as as individuals and musicians, you know, that you didn't have from from the Bronx? Uh, you know, it's 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 brought like a, I, I for me it was kind of like a a validation, you know. I think sometimes with. Uh, with punk bands or with punk music there's always kind of the ideology that anyone could do it you know that anyone could just pick up a guitar anyone could scream into a mic anyone you know could fucking slam on a bass anyone can hit a drum you know but it takes talent to do the mariachi stuff and so for us you know I, I think that it was a validating feeling of like hey we're not just you know these guys who fucking clown around and turn their amps all the way up and fucking run into walls you know it's like <laughs> we can you know we can actually do that something different and you know it, it kind of gave us uh y- you know a, a feeling of you know just like hey you know we're you know we're, we're supposed to be doing this we're doing the right thing and we're growing and we're evolving and we're changing and this is it feels great you know, because you get to a point where you're like, okay, is this uh, is this it? Like, is, is this the peak? You know, and it's like, no. It's, and so with El Bronx, it was like kind of shattering that, you know, shattering that idea was, was you know, key. It's something we needed bad, you know, because we kind of didn't really know where to go, you know. 
So. The songwriting process for that project does it great? Does it greatly differ from the Bronx? Um, no, no. It's like you know, we 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 start with just easy uh, easy demos. You know, the Joby will send me a, a guitar idea, something like that. You know, I'll, I'll put a vocal idea on it, and if it sounds like something cool, then we'll you know pursue it and bring it to the band and build instrumentation and everything else around it. You know, and it's the same thing with El Bronx. You know, it's like we, we just kind of uh, approach things that way. And we've learned that you know, we can't really, we're not like uh, everyone in the room, like uh, Big Bang Theory songwriters, you know what I mean? Like, it's like everything has to have at least just like a simple start to it. You know, someone has to, you know, Joby's a generator. He'll, he'll start, you know, he's the Big Bang. He'll start from scratch. And then, you know, I'll jump on it and then we kind of go from there, you know. So that's that's the way that's works. That's worked best for us, you know, and, and, and it's, uh, you know, it seems to be uh, kind of the only way we, we really enjoy doing things, you know. And there's times when, you know, you get in and you'll be working on one song and then it'll turn into this other thing and then we'll all build this thing together. And it's great. But it's like if we don't have kind of like that spark <clears throat> originally, it's like, uh you know, well, you can sit there for hours and not come up with anything, and then you're just like, ah, you know, driving yourselves crazy. What was your thoughts about? I guess you must have had some backlash from again the punk police when you maybe announced you were going to be doing it before anyone had heard anything, or maybe even perhaps when you first yeah, debuted I mean, that material. Was, <clears throat> to be honest, that was the funnest part. <laughs> right. You know, everyone thought that. Uh, you know, that they're not we going like, to pull this off kind of thing yeah everyone, yeah everyone thought that we were just like you know a bunch of idiots and that we were like you know like you know just messing around or that you know it was like this was the end of the band you know that we were like gonna just you know Im like implode and fall on our face and everyone was gonna laugh at us you know and it was like this whole thing and you know it came out and, and it took a it it, I don't know. I mean, we always knew when, as soon as the first record was done, you know, I, 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 I never really second guessed it, but like, it, it didn't really become real until we were making the record, you know, like as we were like writing the songs, it was like, this is cool, you know, like this, this feels great. But as we were like, as, as we started recording them and the instrumentation started building, uh, you know, it was like, wow, like this is awesome, you know, like, people are going to have to fucking eat it yeah. you know cuz this is this is great <laughs> you know and and that was that was the coolest feeling is knowing you know it's like when you know it's like you you can cuz you can just see people on the outside begin to chirp and like you can hear the chatter talking but you know you're sitting on this great record so it's the greatest feeling in the world because it's just like you know you're just like fuck all these people like you know they're wrong you know so it, it was a great thing to be able to finally unleash that record and then have people be um so receptive of it you know and and have it be something that you know really it's crazy what you know what happened you know it's like i i, I can't believe how that record took off and how you know how much el bronx has done it must know? have kicked open a lot of doors which wouldn't have necessarily been open to the bronx right yeah absolutely i mean 100 percent. you know it's like and it's funny it's like you know we got signed to island def jam the same time as the killers they're good they're awesome awesome great friends we literally had like our signing like dinners like together you know and it's like that's we, two bands i'd never put together yeah and it's there like we've maintained this friendship over the whole time but it's like the killers I, they're not taking the Bronx on tour and other fans will fucking shoot themselves <laughs> you know so it's like but once El Bronx came out they were like hell yeah let's go you know so it's like things like that you know TV shows there's been a yeah, few of those TV as well shows, right shows just giant different tours you know we gotta do yeah we finally gotta do you know like Letterman and Leno and all that all that awesome awesome stuff you know um, and just you know playing different rooms you know you're, you're playing like you know, different like amphitheaters and just stuff like that. And just, it's such a different uh, culture than the one we were used to, you know? Have you been introduced into any new, uh, you know, culture shock worlds that are so different to the punk scene uh, from touring and playing shows? You know and... what, you know what's crazy is it, not really. It's like, like we've done, you know, we've done some like mariachi festivals and stuff like that, but it, you'd be surprised how like, you know, 
just like once the you kind of once you kind of get into like the music yeah. like world, yeah. you know what I mean? Like a lot of like the the ins and outs and the day to day stuff, and it, it, a lot of it is exactly the fucking same. Yeah. You know, it's just different instrumentation, different style of music, different crowd. You know, so it's like all, all the rest of the shit is the same. But that's you know, not saying that the stuff that's different isn't completely game changing for you as a human being. I mean, you're coming across completely different you know musicians different uh, creative types different people you know that are affecting you in in positive ways and it's like you're exchanging information about art and about music and about life and you know it's it's just you know it's like doubling your like your access to like what you can learn and like what you can be and like you know like where you can go you know if you're like stuck in this kind of you know room where there's only kind of one idea you know and then you smash down a wall you know like fucking run dmc and fucking aerosmith and then all of a sudden there's this whole new genre in there and a whole new set of ideals and a whole new you know like sound and you know it's like a whole new history it's like it it you know there's no way you're coming out of that like dumber you know (laughs) you know what i mean like you're only going to learn and you're only going to progress and you're only going to get smarter so it was a, a very huge thing for us and, you know, helped out the Bronx a lot because it just kind of gave us, uh, you know, just kind of, I mean, every time, whether, you know, anytime you write a song, you get better at writing songs, you know? So it doesn't matter if it's like a punk song or a mariachi or Bronx song or whatever. Like anytime you spend time, you know, working on that, you get better so it's like you know we made two El Bronx records and then we went back and did Bronx 4 and you know I just I, I feel like Bronx 4 is you know just an awesome record and it's like a that's my like, favorite by you guys I oh, love thanks, it thanks man I love it that's cool uh, yeah it's uh, you know and it was like it was just it just felt good and it's you know I, I think that you know you you that's one of the awesome things about perseverance and about sticking with something is you do you do find your niche and you get comfortable with your talents and what you can do and, and like your, cre- your own creative process. It doesn't drive you crazy. You know, you just settle into it and you, you know how to use it. And, you know, that's kind of where we're at now. You know, it's like, it, it, it's just a, the only thing that we struggle with is finding the time to do it. I'll bet. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like that, that's really it. It's like, I mean, do you like all if, find if the time to live out, enough as well? Do you, do you feel like maybe you do work too hard as a band? Can you work too hard? Well, we have to. That's the yeah. thing. It's like you can't, you know, we can't really think any other way. It's right. like because, you know, for a band like us, that's how we survive. We have to work hard. You know, we have to be on the road. You know, we have yeah. to tour. We have to write, you know. So it's like that's how we keep it going. And it's like over time, you know, you're able to relax a little bit more. Like, you know, like we tour way less now than we used to. Um, this year we've been, you know, pretty at it, you know, but it's like we had to because we're in between records and we needed to, you know, make sure no one was on the streets. So it's like, you know, we had to tour a lot this year and it's been a blast, you know. So, but, you know, in the early days, I mean, we would just go and go, go, and go, and go. And you're realizing you're like touring for like no reason, you know, it's like there's no real, you know, so you, you get smarter about it. And, and, you know, then it's like, you know, you're able, you know, like to come home and actually have a life at home you know everyone kind of has their own thing that they do you know and it's like everyone has their own existence now that they can enjoy as well as being a member of the bronx and el bronx so in that way it's it's been a slow um you know kind of a a slow thing but you know we're to the point now where we have that kind of you know division between the two so it's really nice you know but it's like we still have to bust ass you know to to keep things going, you know, and and that's just kind of, that's us, that's, that's our identity, and that's what, we don't fight that, you know what I mean, like, that's just what it is, so, um, you know, we're, we're looking forward to, we got, uh, you know, November and December to write Bronx 5, and January to record it, so that's, you know, that's our, that's our window, and, and we're gonna crank it out. What's been going on with these photography, uh, rare one-off album (laughs) items? (laughs) Uh, I just, you know, I, I've been sitting on a, just a bunch of ideas for a really long period of time. And I, you know, as I'm sure a lot of people do, it's like you, the, the you know, the uh, the graveyard between thought and action, you know, is, is chock full of amazing ideas, you know. And it's like, I just got tired of that. 
I got tired of, you know, just kind of not having something that was just mine that I could do and, and you know, these kind of cool things that I wanted to try and, and not, for me, it's like I'm very confident in who I am as a member of the Bronx and as a member of Mariachi El Bronx. But when I try something new, I, I, I lose that confidence because I'm not, you know, I don't know if I can do it. You know what I mean? It's like a normal thing, right? Yeah. So it's like, and I, I, I got tired of that. I wanted to fix that. So I started, you know, I, I started this stolen tuxedo thing. It's like a publishing company, art company, doing my own stuff and other people's stuff. But it's like, it's mostly just kind of a, you know, I, like one, like with the photo books thing, the celebrate the struggle things. You know, I've got 10 years of, of photos of just, you know, touring and, and awesome people and, and just crazy shit, you know? So I just want to start putting it out, you know? And it's it's been really awesome and really fun to do, you know? And it's like, it's, it's teaching me a lot, you know, because I don't really, I'm not really that savvy of a guy, you know, as far as, uh, you know, the graphic design or anything like that. And so it's really cool kind of learning um, everything that way too. And it's, it's been a really kind of healthy thing for me to dive into, uh, you know, when I'm home and, and just kind of do things that way. So how can people find out more about that? Uh, they can go to stolentuxedo.com, you know, they can do that. And, uh, you know, there's, a uh, I'm on Instagram and all that, all that crap too. Um, <laughs> you know, but, what's your uh, thoughts on the place of social media in the role of you know, pushing what a band is up to these days because it's such a big part of it today. Isn't it? Yeah, and it I is. guess you kind of came in it at a is. time when it was just being introduced, right? So yeah. you've seen the evolution from yeah. I hated flyering it. to. I hated it at first. I've embraced it now, and not because I've been forced to, but actually because I'm starting to really enjoy it. Mm. Um, I still, I'm not like a Twitter person. I really enjoy uh, just the aesthetics and the visuals of of Instagram and photography and stuff like that. I think it's really cool for people to have an insight as to what their favorite band is doing, uh, you know, differently or outside of music, you know, whether it's different members uh, individually or as a band, you know, it is frustrating as a human being when you have to like, you know, take a photo for, you know, your band's Instagram and then for your band's Facebook and then for, you know, and it's like, I try to, we try to do these things where we don't like to do the same thing over and over again. So you try to do like different, you know, and then you find yourself spending like an hour or two hours of your time just like updating your social media for the day but it's like i mean really it's not that big of a deal you know what i mean when you think about it it's like that's just the way it is now it's the modern era and that's how people access information so fuck it you know just get with just, the program yeah, just get yeah. with the program i mean you know it's like i, I honestly it's like I, I feel like if you can dive into it in a healthy and creative way you know and you don't you know, like you don't, it's not like a nine to five job. I mean, it is for some people, but for, for us as a band, like, you know, like we're not like, like the band, like we don't start fighting if like someone forgets to post like a social media thing, you know what I mean? Like, it's just, we just take it as it is, you know, we try our best to stay on top of it. You know, if we, if we, if we, if we miss a day, if we, if we miss a day, <laughs> no oh, one's getting well. collared. Yeah. No, one, you know, no one's getting fucking collared. <laughs> So it, it is what it is, man. But I've, I've actually started to um, really embrace it and enjoy it, um, you know, and, and, and I dig it. It's just uh, it becomes tedious, just like everything else, yeah. you know. It's like fucking sound check. I hate sound check. It's like the worst thing in the world, you know, but you have to do it. So just, you know, just fucking get it over with. <laughs> what about we'll have to wrap this up in a minute because I've got to get in and set up my DJ gear um, thank you for chatting of course it's always a pleasure I know we've done a lot of these so sorry if we've gone over stuff which we've spoken about before but oh, it's all good, man. I wanted anyone listening to just you know hear us getting into it uh, what about Matt himself you know as a human what's left for you in this in this life that you'd like to achieve and do and see and be uh, you know I want to a uh, uh, personal goal I want to have a gallery show uh, whether it's paintings or photographs or both uh, that's a personal thing i'm gonna try to do in this next year um so you do a bit of painting as well do you yeah yeah yeah, yeah. and uh you know i would love to do that on a personal level on you know I'm, I'm really you know getting bronx five out is a very important thing for this band so that's first and foremost above anything and that's uh that's all of our main priorities um you know as uh individuals as far as just work goes you know and and, and what we're doing together um you know it's like i i'm really excited about my life personally where I'm at right now I feel like I'm kind of coming out of 
a little bit of a fog. Uh, you know, over the last couple of years, I've been kind of going up and down through some some weird shit, and now I kind of feel like I got my head back on straight. You know what I mean? So I'm really looking forward to diving into the record and you know approaching it from you know the kind of the same way I love approaching records from, which is a personal standpoint, but also not being afraid of tapping into the, the chaos of the world around us right now and, and, and you know, try to change and the perspective and stuff on that and put it towards music and just kind of, you know, to continue moving forward and progressing, man. It's like, a, you know, I feel pretty healthy as a human being. Uh, you know, I think that there's still a lot of, you know, amazing music and art that come out of these both bands that we have. And, you know, it's like, I'm just really focused on that and looking forward to it, man. Well, please never change. Um, you know, I think that we've spent quite a bit of time over the last few years in various situations, whether it's interviewing or the live scenario. Or The one thing that I've always loved about your band and you in particular as a front man and the you know the voice piece of that group is the positivity that you project oh, you know absolutely. even in like Thank dark you. serious crazy unsettling yeah. times yeah you have a sense of humor um <laughs> which helps with everything doesn't it and yeah. also you have just a, a positivity and a light that, oh thank you it doesn't go unnoticed that. and uh keep doing what you do absolutely my brother, brother. thanks absolutely. for a good chat of course Hey 